So, uh, all right, the second lecture for Christian Ethics for Houston Graduate School of Theology um, after the Catholic Campus shutdown. Uh, the last lecture was review. I know a lot of people missed the class uh, right before spring breaks. So that's why I uh, went ahead and just did a review of that whole section there. Um, and this time we're going to be doing ethics from the margins. So by that, this is looking at ethical responses from traditionally overlooked groups. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to talk about what, what that means in those different groups. This is going to be primarily focused on like 20th century, mid 20th century onward is mostly what we're going to be looking at. So um, kind of broad overlying structure of this is that we're going to look at um, you know, liberation theology, African ethics, other what's called majority world. I'm going to define that term here a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to move from that to talking about uh, black American ethics. Uh, so what black theology is and um, where that comes from. Uh, and the, the correct term is black theology, not African American theology. Um, and then after that, we're going to be looking at um, gendered uh, Christian ethics. So that's going to involve feminist ethics. That also involves a lot of what's known as intersectional ethics. Um, we will briefly touch on uh, transgender and queer ethics. I know that may be a bit controversial. Um, this is an interdenominational seminary, so we're going to have a, a variety of opinions on this. Um, and uh, with the dis disabilities and age and that kind of thing, a lot of that's going to be reserved for the online discussion forum. So um, we'll kind of save that for there. Um, for right now, we're going to get through this. So let me define a little bit about what we mean with by the majority world. Um, so majority world, um, a lot of history does focus on um, the you know geopolitical intrigue, a lot of the things that happen in Europe and the legacy outside of Europe. So it's going to include places like America and Australia and that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, and even today, this is a group that has a massive influence, but in terms of population, um, it is actually, uh, not where the majority of people live. Most people live outside of that area. I mean, you're talking China and India, but also Central and South America, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this is where most people live. And especially when we're talking about those, those later two groups, Central South America and Sub-Saharan Afri Africa, uh, it's a population that's disproportionately young, um, and uh, what's known as you know traditionally Western nations, their populations are more or less stabilizing. But in, in those last two groups, the population uh, growth rate is expected to grow just considerably. In addition to that, um, as far as Christianity is concerned, two thirds of Christians don't live in this Western world. They live in what's known as the majority world. Um, and in fact, in a lot of Europe, especially, but in certain parts of America as well, uh, in Canada, things like that, um, you do see people that understand themselves to be living in what might be known as a, a post-Christian age. Um, so that's not, like where most of the church is going is not in those areas. It's in the areas of Central South America, um, it's in kind of, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so a lot of the philosophical ethical starting points tend to be different in those areas than traditional Western points. Not necessarily so, uh, they're definitely, they, they draw on that, especially now that we're looking at 20th century, but they may not necessarily be the same starting point. So that's kind of where we're going with that. Um, we really have to begin talking with this about, with uh, liberation theology. That's really where a lot of these things started. So liberation theology um, decided that there's going to be uh, an emphasis in, on um, praxis over theosis uh, as a means of what was known as poiesis. Um, this ends up being kind of a more uh, Hegelian um, or even Marxist view of how to look at, at the world. Um, and there is some history to this that predates that, though. Um, it does draw on some historical precedent. And so they look at a few key individuals, uh, Bartolome uh, de Casas in uh, the 1500s, um, actually passed a law against uh, slavery very early on. He fought against what he viewed as colonial abuse um, of many of the natives in, uh, in the, the area known as the Indies. Um, he, somewhat controversially, uh, he did, was a proponent of the African slave trade um, and preferred that to enslaving the natives of the Indies, but, uh, you know, man of his time, that kind of thing. Um, you also have Antonio uh, de Montesinos uh, in uh, Hispaniola, who was very anti-slavery of all kinds. Um, Antonio uh, Vieira in the 1600s in Brazil also fought slavery, uh, spoke out. We have writings of his against economic injustice as he saw that. 
argues that sermon should be for the people. And by the people, it means like the common people, the majority people, and this is the people that lived in Brazil. Uh, and then in um, the 18th and 19th century, you have uh, Brother Caneca, uh, who fought against um, Portuguese co colonists during that time. So that's kind of some of the history that feeds into liberation theology. Um, then you have a lot of these populist and then eventually communist revolts uh, that happen in um, you know, the, the island period, Central America, uh, South America. So a lot of these things started to happen in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and then they also look to some of the legacy that you have from, uh, so, from some Europeans. So it's not just anti-Western, anti-European, because you do have people like Théodore de Cardin, uh, Henri de Lubac, uh, Monnier and a few others that, that they draw on that thinking as well. Um, really, one of the big kind of key points for them, though, is also the Second Vatican Council, which kind of helps out a lot of liberation theology. Um, so, before we continue talking about liberation theology, we're going to talk about Vatican II or the Second Vatican Council. Um, so, it was called in 1959 by uh, Pope John the 23rd, um, and it had been a hundred years since they had previously had an ecumenical council of any kind. So the Second Vatican uh, Ecumenical Council, um, for the attendees of that council, uh, eventually went on to become popes, uh, both John Paul's, uh, as well as Paul IV and Benedict, um, the, you know, the, the last pope uh, before our current pope. Um, uh, these were all attendees of the Second Vatican Council. The emphasis here was on reconciliation. So during this time period, um, it was understood that uh, by uh, Pope John XXIII, um, the, the Catholic Church was in a bit of a crisis at this moment. And so they needed to do something, and they thought that, okay, a lot of this needs to be reconciliation within the church and society, just within the church itself, and between um, that church and other groups as well. Uh, and so there's a lot of different things that they did. Uh, Kind of in order to achieve that, um, there's a heavy emphasis on making faith, uh, and, and by the the Roman Catholic faith, more accessible in relation. So practically what they did um, was mass uh, moved out of the Latin and went into the, the vernacular, so whatever the native language was that people spoke. Um, and instead of the priest having his back to the congregation, um, it was strongly recommended that priests now face the congregation. Um, during uh, both the homilies and in uh, particularly when they are doing the Eucharist. So they're not, um, you know, giving the, the blessing um, with their back turned, but rather they're now on the other side of the table um, so that they're facing the people as they elevate the host. Um, so beyond this, they also encouraged uh, more association with non-Catholics and non-Christians even, um, allowing for prayer uh and like communal prayer with non-Catholic Christians became allowed as a result of the Second Vatican Council. Um, there was a re-emphasis on uh, Bible and personal reading. Um, previously, it, like, not say that they, they never, you know, it, it would be a mistake to say that Roman Catholics did not emphasize the Bible and personal reading, um, but there became a much stronger emphasis um, you know, following the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and there was also more encouragement of, of freedom and creativity among clergy. Um, so if you remember when like the Pentecostal charismatic movement happened, um, that kind of the Second Vatican Council allowed for that to happen within the Roman Catholic Church as well. Without Vatican II, you don't have that movement in Roman Catholicism. Um, so that ends up being a very important kind of precursor to a lot of what happens with liberation theology. So liberation theology, um, if my computer doesn't crash, okay. Uh, so, primary figure uh, for liberation theology is Gustavo Gutierrez. Uh, there's some discussion questions um, that I'll, I'll be sending the link out to um, for you to talk about uh, Gustavo Gutierrez and what we're going to get to later with James Cohn. Um, but early on, this foundational stage of liberation theology, um, you have both Roman Catholics and Protestants participating in it. Um, as I mentioned, there is a heavy kind of Marxist tenor to it. Um, so they bought it because they're wanting to link social science with theology. Now it's not full on Marxism because Marx was, uh, you know, anti um, religion to a large extent. So it is definitely an adopted Marxism uh, or adapted Marxism, um, but that's that's part of it, uh, and it opened up a lot of new boundaries. Um, so it's kind of in the early stages of it. Then you have what's known as the building stage, and they want to focus on creating a fundamental theology, and that's a technical term in Roman Catholicism. Uh, that focuses on doctrines 
Um, so it's distinct from systematic uh, theology, but it focuses instead on um, doctrines, that kind of thing. It's, it's roughly akin to what might be known as philosophical theology. Um, not exactly, but, but roughly. It is more of a Roman uh, Catholic term. Uh, so you don't see that in a lot of Protestant theology. So it starts trying to shift its emphasis uh, more heavily within Roman Catholicism. Um, there was a lot more emphasis on spirituality, Christology, ecclesiology, like what does liberation mean for our spiritual life? What, how do we understand who Christ is? How do we understand the role of the church in all this? And then they have what's referred to as the setting the stage movement. Uh, so you move from uh, the spiritual experience to what's known as analytic seeing. So you analyze the situation and look at it to theological judging. You make an evaluation to pastoral action. Uh, and this is really where liberation theology starts to uh, take off. Um, that you have to, you can't just talk about it in these theoretical terms that you get with the early few stages. Now it has to be linked to practice. You have to do something about it. So you have um, theologians end up leaving their academic bases uh, at universities and seminaries, uh, and instead they start to go become pastors and priests and different things like that. Um, so that's a lot of what it is. It is very active. It does sometimes resort to violence. Um, that is actually one of the main critiques of uh, liberation theology, is that uh, because it is you know, strongly Marxist, uh, it, it will you know, support the upheaval of um, you know, oppressors and the, the, you know, the, the you know, proletariat and, and, and that kind of thing. So, um, then you have what's known as the formalization stage. Uh, so they start to kind of rethink how we think about revelation, how we think about tradition, what theology means, what these doctrines mean. Uh, and they start working with other movements outside of that, and, and becomes a very heavy involvement with the oppressed. Um, so this is also where another critique is um, of liberation theology, is that they start to kind of lose um, some of what might be known as its you know, more Christian uh, aspects of it, because it it tends to be um, focused more on political action and less on spiritual salvation. Um, and what might be known as a major critique is that it has an over-realized uh, eschatology. So today, they're still around, still especially pocketed in um, certain areas of South and Central America. You see it other places as well, but that's still where its kind of main emphasis is. And there's still a focus on communities and community organization, uh, kind of rising up from the people. Um, there's a heavier focus on education of uh, people, and in particular those who are seen as oppressed in order to empower them. Uh, that's kind of the point of that, uh, to, to fight their oppression. Um, very, very political, very much leans Marxist. It's not as Marxist as it was probably in the early days, but it still leans very heavily that way. Um, you're supposed to vote, write letters, work with governments, but also against governments. Um, violent, you know, revolution, Marxist revolution is not out of the question for some liberation theologians. Uh, I've already talked about the violence bit that is some, sometimes seen as justifiable. Uh, it's a very heavy emphasis on the realized eschatology, that Christ's kingdom is here, we are called to build it now. Um, as I said, one of the main critiques is that it's an over-realized uh, eschatology, whereas the rebuttal is, well, you have an under-realized eschatology. Uh, it's kind of the thought there. Um, one of the kind of key phrases that you see a lot of times is that the political, is the ethical, is the theological that these are not separate realms, that they are all connected and interconnected, and we need to start thinking about them more interconnected. That to do theology is to do politics. To do theology is to do ethics. To do ethics is an expression of theology and politics. So they, they're all interwoven within that. Um, there is also a running theme that God has a preferential disposition toward the poor, that he is on the side of the poor and against the rich. So if you, again, look at uh, Jesus' sermon on the plane, I know we've talked about this a few times, um, but Jesus says, you know, blessed are the poor, and then a few verses down, cursed are the rich. And there's no in spirit there. It's just the poor and the rich. And this is really heavily drawn on by liberation theology. So it is very controversial. A lot of the things that we're going to be talking about are controversial. I think it's important to give them each uh, their voice here. Um, so some connected movements we're going to talk about. Um, so there's something called uh, Minyong Theology, uh, which is focused in uh, South Korea. Uh, again, it's, it's a heavy focus on people. Um, Han, which is kind of like a, you know, unconditional love, is seen as the guiding principle there. We can also look at something called Dalit Theology, 
um, which is focused on uh, the Dalits. So this is in the Hindu caste system. Um, that the Dalits are those who are outside of the caste system, right? Now they're more commonly known as untouchables. So um, in Dalit theology, you see the Dalits, these who are on the lowest rung of society, they're even not even on the same uh, caste system as everyone else. Um, they're instead viewed as most loved by God. Um, they, there's an outright rejection of castes and social structure and societal order uh, as far as it concerns these different structures and that kind of thing, especially against the work of, of this, the upper caste, Brahmins. Um, there's a heavy emphasis on the idea that woundedness, that pain, that suffering, that anger, that these are sacred things and sacred events. And you see this influence very heavily upon Mother Teresa and the work that she does in, in or she did in India. So with Mother Teresa, um, she talks about how, like, in the midst of suffering, you find yourself closest to God, and there is like a sanctifying part that happens with suffering. And this is draws very heavily on Dalit theology. Um, and it's this idea that, that kind of last bullet point there that the the image of God is attained through the way of suffering and the identification with the oppressed. That these two things is how you see the face of God, and you see that in, in Mother Teresa's writings, um, where she talks about how she sees the face of God in in these people. That is very heavily drawn on um, Dalit theology, which has some connections. It's not exactly the same as liberation theology. It's not nearly as Marxist. Uh, but it does have a lot of the same connections going on there. Okay, just for time's sake, we're going to keep moving. We're going to move on. Uh, so we're going to talk, move now to South African ethics, which is going to be really different character than a lot of the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, because it stayed kind of in that colonial mindset uh, and there was the apartheid for a really long time. So uh, this is really, it's been kind of, the key understanding of South African ethics or Christian ethics is that it's opposition to um, apartheid and its transition away from par apartheid. So apartheid, if you're unaware, is the kind of systematic, uh, not just racism, not just discrimination, but acts of violence against um, those who are natives to South Africa. So black native South Africans by those who, uh, they may have been born there, but um, they are definitely either directly, you know, colonizing or more likely descendants of those who are, are colonized uh, South Africa. So that's kind of what happened uh, with that. Um, but the political figure, the key political figure against apartheid was Nelson Mandela. But theologically speaking, the key figure is definitely going to be Desmond Tutu. Um, so Mandela was definitely a communist. He utilized what was known as focused violence, the idea of sabotage. Um, and indeed, he was responsible for um, like bombing certain critical water plants, that kind of thing, when the staffing was low. So he's not talking about attacking people, but institutions. Desmond Tutu does not fall in line with that. He, he absolutely rejects that. Um, Tutu does hold, Tutu holds this, uh, you know, Anglican familial bond. So he does think that we are all part of the Anglican church if you're Anglican. And that, that is part of his theology. Uh, and it sought to unify black theology, which we'll talk about, uh, and African theology, which we're both going to talk about here in a second, is a lot of what Desmond Tutu wanted to do. Um, the key document is known as the Kairos document, and this plays on the distinction in Greek between Kairos and Kronos. So Kronos is that more kind of linear time, seconds, minutes, days, that, that you can measure out in very regular, regular, whereas Kairos is more of these kind of moments or event-driven time. And Tutu was kind of pointing to the fact that this is the moment, this is the Kairos that happens. Um, it is technically, uh, you know, pseudonymous, but I mean, it was all certainly written by Tutu. Um, it calls for a state theology, um, and it um, talks, you know, kind of against state theology. Um, sorry, it, it doesn't call for it. It talks against state theology, and specifically that there are three forms of state theology, all of which are incorrect. Um, so communism is called out as a form of state theology, which is incorrect. Um, there's the god of state, that the state is above all, and we should make sacrifices to the state. It's kind of the state becomes a god, so that's going to be rejected. And this idea of law and order, which, you know, in South Africa has the same kind of connotations, it's the same buzzword, it's the same kind of dog whistle, you might say, for cracking down on specific groups to maintain the status quo instead of working against that. And um, so... You have that, and then you also have what's known as church theology. is another kind of area that he identifies in this Kairos document. 
Um, so in church theology, there is this call for reconciliation. Um, but Tutu uh, is critical of a lot of what he calls church theology because they want reconciliation without justice. He says that justice is needed for reconciliation. Justice is not an expression of law and order, but rather it's a um, proper understanding of what God wants to do in the world. Um, he does think that there might be a place for violence, but it has to be a proper uh, understanding of violence, and that really a lot of church theology um, that wants to reject it outright, uh, for Tutu he's going to argue they have an under-realized eschatology. So you see that term there again, uh, that they don't believe that God is doing something great um, here. So um, instead, uh, Tutu argues for what's known as prophetic theology. Uh, so this is where uh, Tutu believes that we should go. This is what should replace the church theology. Um, and he points to the fact that the Bible is constantly calling people for change uh, and that God is always aligning himself with the poor and the oppressed, um, that God has specific laws about making sure you care for the widow, the orphan, the foreigner in your land, um, that God is always aligning himself up with Israel, that they are a people that were enslaved and brought out of Egypt. Um, that any resistance to tyranny, if it's true tyranny, this is something that is blessed and endowed by God. And ultimately, there's a big focus on hope with that. Uh, and so Tutu kind of concludes that document with a big call to action, that now's the moment, here's the time, and that kind of thing. Okay, so the key outcome of a lot of this. So a part, Nelson Mandela is elected, the apartheid falls, and Tutu is kind of called upon um, to give a response. And so one of the key outcomes of this is what's known now as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and for Tutu, he believes that, it was, that truth, to speak the truth, was both restorative and uh, which was restorative and retributive, but it has a heavier emphasis on that restorative aspect. Um, he wanted the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to not just be a state-run thing. He definitely wanted it to be explicitly Christian with a mandate toward forgiveness. Um, and it was an emphasis on truth as well as amnesty. This is where the forgiveness part comes in. So uh, if you're unfamiliar, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a period of time, um, you did have a time window, it wasn't unlimited, um, but you could come before the, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, and if you had done anything that was directly a result of apartheid, regardless of whether you were um, to have the oppressor, um, or you were the one who was oppressed and you, were, you did some act of violence in response to that. Regardless of where you stood, um, you can make a confession um, and then potentially be granted amnesty. And in fact, um, of the, the you know, several thousand people came forward or were brought forward, and uh, you know, around almost a thousand of them, 849, were granted full amnesty. Now, some of them had uh, mitigated amnesty. Um, some of them did not have any amnesty, so there were like certain restrictions that were in place on that. Um, but the point of this was reconciliation above all else. That the point of justice is to reconcile. The point of justice is to restore. Um, and that starts with truth. So that's kind of South African ethics. We're going to move from that to talking about uh, African theology more broadly. And here we're really focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so, this kind of African theology tends to be very anti-colonialist. Uh, if you know any of the history of colonialism, um, you do know that a lot of European countries basically exploited goods, they started the slave trade, um, a lot of things that happened in Africa as a result of this. Uh, because of that, um, because they're anti-colonialist, they're going to reject what they view as Western European interpretation of scripture, uh, as well as the methodologies or assumptions behind a lot of theology or philosophy. Uh, so the idea that even black theology, which you know, we haven't talked about yet, we're about to, but even black theology is seen as too white because black theology doesn't reject all of this. Um, so they want to reject all that. That means they're not going back to Plato. Um, they're not going back to Aristotle. Um, they're going to instead look to African philosophy and African theology. Um, there's a re-emphasis on this, you know, unique contribution that is given from the African perspective for the purpose of theology. So um, one of the key figures in this is uh, John Beatty, uh, and kind of the, the key work there, you see African uh, religions and philosophy. Um, and 
his, one of his main arguments is that you can't really learn African theology. You have to live it. You have to do it. Um, and he does say that there are you know, sources for that. You have biblical theology. What does the Bible say? How does it interpret itself? Um, understanding what Christendom is as the kingdom of God. Looking at the African religions and the fact that he is wanting to be informed by various African religions is important for that. And then looking at the living African church, the current African church as it is, it's a, it's a practice that has to be done. Um, so because it's, it's centered in Africa, it's going to reject all Western paradigms. And like I said, that includes black theology. Um, and it says that to be African, to have the African experience, that is necessarily a religious experience. So he divides African um, theology uh, into two parts. Metaphysics, which he believes is life, and ethics, how to live. So he's going to use some of the terminology um, of Western philosophy, but he's going to change the term, what it means um, to a certain extent. Now, how to live, it does fit a little bit more aligned with ethics. Um, but then within that, within ethics, within his how to live, he's going to say that God disapproves of evil not because of the evilness, uh, because it's inherently evil, but because... Evil is contrary to the experience of human life, and God is for human life. So even there, even when we're talking about ethics, it's not a hard distinction between metaphysics and ethics that you get with a lot of traditional philosophy. Um, it is much more fluid and much more open. Um, so continuing on in that strain, uh, you also have Tinyiko Maluleke, uh, um, that uh, Federal Theological Seminary, uh, and he wants to have a new focus. Uh, on current issues, so not just old issues, but current issues. And he spends a lot of time in particular talking about climate change. Um, and uh, instead of talking about some of these other kind of theological terms, he talks heavily in terms of what's known as the scandal of reciprocity, um, that there is a social cosmic element that between the relationship between us and the greater cosmos, or that's environment or something else. Um, but then they, that other structure or other group also uh, has a reciprocal impact upon us based upon what we feed into the system. Um, so he um, wants to move beyond, again, this kind of Western American liberation paradigm. Um, because he says that, that still, that's not African Christianity. That is a Western product. Uh, he doesn't like the the Dubaisian uh, Tunis, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, it's not Africanity versus Christianity. Um, he sees this as another false dichotomy there. Um, and then he's also going to talk about that Christ is located in African bodies rather than extended there, which is another key distinction. <laughs> okay. Um, so when I say that Christ is located rather than extended in African bodies, it means that Jesus is in them. Um, it's not that Jesus, you know, extends himself into them, but that's where you find Christ. So kind of a more radical view of that. Um, and he believes that African Christianity is um, uniquely narratival uh, in structure, um, but it, you can't just ignore colonial impression that that forms a critical part of what African theology today is. Uh, and then you have uh, Laman Sane, um, and for Sane, he's gonna fo or he, he focused on um, translation. Uh, it's kind of where he focused a lot of that. For him, translation, um, to translate something is to interpret something, which is not particularly a controversial view, that when you translate, you add interpretations as well. Um, he thinks that translation is key to preserving uh, native life. Um, which is something that's different that you, than um, Islam, which does not believe that you, know, you should translate the Quran, for instance. Um, and it's also distinct from oral trans, uh, trans tradition. So he does believe that you need to be able to translate, uh, and that translation serves as this ultimate paradigm for how African Christians live in the here and now. Um, and that when we talk about ethics, we need to talk about it in terms of translation as well that Africans do not speak the same language in more ways than one than Western than Westerners do. And so there needs to be a translation of African language to Western ears and from Western language to African ears. Um, there's been a lot of Western language to African ears, and much more so for Sane than there has been from 
uh, African uh, language to Western ears, and there needs to be more of that going on uh, as, as part of that. So, um, kind of moving on to, I know we're kind of hitting these rapid fire, uh, kind of moving on to other majority world uh, Christian ethics that we're going to talk about. So, China um, is working kind of in, uh, with the background of Confucianism. Uh, Confucianism has the five virtues, um, Ren, Yi, Li, Zi, Jin, um, and the, the five relationships. So, I mean, you can pause the video and look at those if you want to. Um, there's a rejection of Confucian thought uh, and uh, orientation away from man and toward God. Um, so that, that's kind of, they're, they're going to reject a lot of that Confucian thought to accept traditional Christian views that uh, man is sinful, uh, pantheism is wrong, uh, is incorrect, is mistaken. Um, and there is a difference between state law and personal righteousness. And that's not a Confucian ideal. So they're going to move away from that. There's a conscious uh, rejection of Confucianism. Um, uh, so that's kind of going on in the background there. You also have in the Philippines. Um, in the Philippines, uh, there's kind of a growing movement of uh, virtue ethics uh, that's informed primarily by the passion of the Christ. And what those uh, virtues are, um, are very, like the, the, the list here that you have. And again, you can pause it and look at these. These are what the different virtues are um, for uh, these Filipino ethicists that are working in a virtue ethics group. Um, and it is, is very heavily tied to Christianity there. Uh, so I'm going to keep going. I do want to spend some time talking about um, black theology and a few other things. So black theology, let's, let's start talking about that. Um, you have kind of historical precedents in this with Frederick Douglass uh, and Sojourner Truth. Um, Sojourner Truth is going to show up again with womanist theology in particular. Um, Booker T. Washington uh, was another kind of early precursor to black theology. Booker, Booker T. Washington wanted to focus on um, education, believing that education was a tool uh, to be used to lift um, black people up. You have W.E.B. Du Bois, um, that's how you pronounce his name, um, uh, not Du Bois, Du Bois, uh, and when we talk about the duality of black American consciousness, and by that he means um, that to be a black American is to embody two identities. Um, you're both black and American. Um, and so that's, again, that's an early precursor to this that, that helps inform black theology. Uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, the Black to, Back to Africa movement um, of you know, reclaiming that cultural heritage. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, I will say, is an important figure for black theology. Um, he was black, he was a theologian, but he's not considered a black theologian. Um, nevertheless, a uh, letter from a Birmingham jail in particular, um, much more so than his um, I Had a Dream speech, is really kind of informative. It's, it's kind of great piece of rhetoric um, that's used in the forms of a lot. There's a connection with liberation theology, but it's not the same thing as liberation theology. In fact, early early on it was referred to as black liberation theology. You see um, James Cone still uses that term. Um, it has roots in the black power movement of the 1960s um, that uh, not only um, are, you know, not only are African Americans equal, but in some respects they're, they're better. Um, so that's part of that that's going on there. Um, James Cone uh, is one of the, where one of the readings is that we came from. So just kind of briefly summary, um, we might roughly phrase his uh, overall thinking as that the American Jesus is too white. Um, and that's, there's a dual meaning to that, because um, whiteness means something very specific for Cone. Um, but also, just practically speaking, like, if we're going to look at the history of it, Jesus was a Middle Eastern Jewish man, um, so almost definitely not uh, white in skin tone, definitely not European. But there, Cone uses whiteness in a different way also. Um, the phrasing that he has is that to be a black American Christian, and he does very intentionally use the term black, not African American theology, black American Christian, uh, has been to view oneself as a chocolate-colored white man. This is the problem that he sees, um, is that a lot of uh, theology um, and Christianity up to this point was, it's white Christianity, oh, and you just happen to have black skin on top of that. Um, and he'll say, like, that is, that is the incorrect view of how to, how to 
understand your own identity. So he's actually kind of reject, like he acknowledges this kind of duality of identities um, that we see with uh, Du Bois, um, but he's going to kind of move away from that. Uh, his key work, and I encourage anyone to read it, is The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Um, and it talks about uh, how the lynching tree uh, was used throughout history. Um, that the lynching tree was used in America to remind blacks of their inferiority and powerlessness within this white culture that dominated them. Um, and that if you want to examine suffering or abuse of power, you have to examine the lynching tree. Um, for Cone, that means to even begin to understand what the cross is, you also have to acknowledge and understand what the lynching tree was, because they are definitely very strongly connected. Um, he is critical of Martin Luther King Jr. because he believes that he fails to address the challenge of faith presented by the lynching tree. That for Cone, uh, the theology of Martin Luther King Jr. is still that chocolate-covered, uh, chocolate-colored white man theology. Uh, so he doesn't think that King goes far enough. Um, he does kind of end that work by talking about that there is hope beyond the tragedy expressed in the lynching tree, and that's what the resurrection of Christ shows us. Um, but again, I encourage you to, to read that. It is what's known as a realized eschatology. I've been using that term a few times here. Um, so hopefully that makes a little bit more sense here now that we're talking about that. Um, All right, and um, also talks about that uh, this idea of blackness, um, that he has a uniquely black uh, outlook on it, black perspective on it, but at the same time, blackness can be a substitute for really any oppressed group. The poor have a blackness um, in the face of whiteness, and by whiteness, it's you know upper middle class, upper class, white male American, because there's a certain sense in which women have a blackness. Um, so that kind of acts as that there is blackness and whiteness, but blackness for Cone ends up being the stand-in for any group that's oppressed. Um, where you see the biggest influence um, today is probably going to be Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. Um, this is the church that was Jeremiah Wright, uh, which the sermon that Jeremiah Wright gave, that um, if you were unfamiliar, this is known as you know, Obama's pastor, there's a big controversy there about that. This is a very much in line with black theology. Um, so that's kind of where, and it's still today, to this day, uh, very much in line with that. Okay, um, kind of moving on, uh, we're going to start talking about Cornell West as well. Um, for Cornell West, and we're going to move through this a little bit more quickly. Uh, so for Cornell West, uh, America is inex inexorably tied to racism and white supremacy. Um, and you can you know, pause and look at the different quotes there. Uh, he talks about September 11th um, and believes that this is really the first time that white Americans caught a glimpse of what it means to not be a white American. Uh, to be a black American, to be a uh, you know, uh, Middle Eastern American, um, to be an Indian American, to be any group that's not white American. They caught a glimpse of what it means to feel unsafe, unprotected, subject to random violence, subject to hatred, based solely upon their identity. Um, now, Cornel West is not a Marxist, but he is unapologetically socialist. Uh, and he also kind of, but he does adopt that term from liberation theology, that the ethical is political. Um, and he, um, you know, ended up believing that Obama, although he initially supported him, he pulled that back um, because he believed that Obama was too supportive of the, what he called the American war machine uh, and, and different things like that. So um, for Cornell West, there's this interplay between ethics, uh, in ethics between hope and pragmatism and the power of language and how language is used. Um, fascinating figure, still very active uh, and doing a lot of black theology, doing a lot of ethics, um, even today. Um, we're going to transition from that um, to now talking about uh, feminist ethics a little bit. Um, so, Phyllis Tribble uh, is kind of a good uh, biblical interpreter for uh, feminist theology more broadly. Two main works, uh, Text of Terror, uh, which is a very close reading of these uh, four stories uh, from the Old Testament, very close reading and viewing, um, like, what do we do with the terror presented there? Her more, uh, I guess, more highly cited work is God 
and the rhetoric of sexuality. Um, and she argues for using feminist imagery for God, that in Genesis 2 you have that God created them in the image of God, male and female. Um, and she really sets up, she's an Old Testament scholar, um, so she's going to focus mostly in the Old Testament. But she sees that the whole structure of the Bible is really best understood as a love story that went awry. Uh, and you see that happen between Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. Um, that the redemption of that love story you see in Song of Songs. Um, so that's kind of Phyllis Tribble. She is an important influential figure in what we're going to be talking about. We're going to move now to talk about specifically Christian feminist ethics. Um, Elizabeth uh, Schusler Forenza is another important figure uh, in memory of her. Uh, and she talks about a hermeneutic of suspicion um, that we need to approach um, all of our beliefs, values, that kind of thing, with a certain hermeneutic of suspicion. Um, she's going to draw on, and really a lot of early Christian feminist ethicists, draw on historical figures. Um, it was like uh, Hildegard von Benjen, uh, Julian of Norwich, uh, and important figures in the Reformation. Um, older figures are going to be like Mary uh, Wollstonecraft and, 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 and the, those kind of purposes. Okay. Um, feminist approaches uh, here, so there's some kind of like lip was known as liberal classical feminism. Um, we're going to work towards equality. Um, the kind of second approach is this universal paradigm uh, that um, to be feminine is to be you know, attended by a, an ethics of care, that you have maternal instincts, that's more, and then there's this more radical shift away from um, patriarchy into what's often, what, what's sometimes termed an egalitarian matriarchy. Um, that instead of having uh, a patriarchy, you do have an egalitarian society, but more of a matriarchal society that this is where you get there's some critique here um, that the idea is that uh, women might even be better than men now that that's kind of the critique some of the, the more extreme critique there get that um, and then you have uh, people like uh, Betty Friedan uh, who rejects uh, the feminine mystique and, and this universal paradigm and that kind of thing um, and for a lot of uh, you know feminist approaches you want to say that understanding the context um, is key for understanding the ethics. So if you look at a, an ethical situation, something that might be ethically dubious or not, you have to understand the context. And for the feminist ethicist, this is really important, um, that this is something that is, is often overlooked, that you can't just pull these situations and dissect them in the laboratory, you really have to understand the much bigger, broader history and context behind that. Um, that's a big uh, part of that. Um, there, they believe there's an argument to be made that that kind of more laboratory approach or decisionist based approach is a, a male notion of morality that we want to get away from. Uh, and with, within feminist ethics, that leads very directly to what's known as intersectionality. And so let's talk about intersectionality. In ethics. So intersectionality is the belief that just as a dominant Western ethics is informed by history, uh, that's white and male, cisgendered and heteronormative, so other communities may belong uh, to multiple groups as well. So other individuals, sorry, I should say, uh, may belong to multiple communities as well. So um, we can talk about womanist theology, mujerista theology, and lesbian theology. Um, we'll briefly touch on, on some of that. Um, but really what intersectionality is focused on is this understanding that every person has a unique story. And these stories all speak to each other, but they speak to each other on different levels or not on equal footing. And so we have to recognize that these different stories are present, that they speak to each other, while also recognizing that life is more holistic than these individual stories. So it's not that you are a woman and you are Hispanic. And that it, you know, it's not just those two. It's that you are a Hispanic woman. Um, it's not that you are, uh, you know, black, and that you are a woman, and that you are gay. No, it's that you're a, you know, a uh, black lesbian. Um, like that is a, a unique identity on its own, as well as these different identities that you hold. And that's really what intersectionality is getting at. So um, we're going to talk about womanist ethics first. So Womanist ethics is for um, ethics that kind of comes from and arises out of black women, 
Uh, so that's kind of what uh, womanist ethics uh, looks at. Um, so some of the kind of key figures here, you have Sojourner Truth with her speech, Ain't I a Woman? That's kind of an early precursor that's looked to a lot. Um, but a lot of this is understanding what it is to be black and be a woman, which is to be both exploited by men, that's to, uh, that's to be uh, black and to be a woman. Uh, so to be a woman is to be exploited by men, and to be black is to be exploited by white women as well as, as black uh, as, as um, black men. Uh, and white men, so specifically to be exploited by white women. Um, so that, that's part of what this is. Um, there's a strong identification in womanist ethics with Hagar, um, who is this oppressed woman, the, the maid servant of Sarah. Um, this is an ethics, when they talk about ethics, ethics for those who are dominated. Um, so to be a black woman is to, to live in a society that seeks your subjugation. And so what does ethics look like for that? So important figures, bell hooks, uh, name is not capitalized, that's intentional. Uh, Katie Cannon uh, and Emily Town, um, they have this historical narrative basis. Um, we'll talk about in the discussion page, we will have some questions on womanist and uh, mujerista ethics. Um, we also have uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, Jacqueline Grant, Dolores Williams. Um, again, wish we had time to talk about all these, but we're get, already getting close to an hour, so I want to make sure we get through this. Um, so, uh, the reading from Dolores Womans and uh, Ada Maria uh, Isasi Diaz, who is a mujerista, uh, Dolores Williams is going to be a Romanist. Uh, we're going to talk about that on the discussion page. Okay. Um, so, areas of womanist ethical focus um, we're going to focus on spirituality, theodicy, ontology, a dialogue between black male and white feminist theologians, and identifying how they're different from these groups, but they do have things to say. With these groups because they are both black and uh, feminist. Um, and then there's a heavy emphasis on biblical ethics, like what does the Bible say about this? So uh, we're going to talk about biomedical ethics in particular because um, if you look at, you know, any kind of medical statistics in America especially, um, the maternal mortality rate, uh, that's women who die in childbirth or due to complications of childbirth, is significantly higher for black women than it is for any other population. So there's a lot of focus on biomedical ethics uh, and public health and that kind of thing. Um, and then how to relate to black churches as a woman who is also black. So that's, those are kind of some key ideas there. I do want to briefly talk about queer theology. I know this is probably the more most controversial area that we're going to be talking about in this course. Um, so that and um, transgender uh Theology. So we're going to talk about that very briefly. Um, we're going to run through it um, kind of quickly. So queer ends up being this umbrella term that refers to gender sexualities, basically anything that is not cisgender. That means you're born the same gender, uh, sex and gender. Um, and heteronormativity, uh, the term of uh, that you know the society is set up for heterosexuals. Um, that it kind of assumes that uh, kind of thing. So that's queer is an umbrella term for anyone who doesn't fit in there. Um, and that, that is the, the term uh, that's used from queer theologians. Um, we'll try to talk about some of the history of that here in a little bit. Um, the idea that there is an ethical discourse um, that is distinct, uh, that needs to happen from both gendered and sexual margins. So gendered margins is not just women, but transgendered. Um, and from sexual margins of, um, you know, I'm not... You know, if you are not attracted to the same uh, gender or the same sex, like what is that? Or if you are rather, um, or if you're bisexual, or you know any of those different terms, like what does that actually mean? So they do draw inspiration from these groups that we've been talking about: feminist, womanist, liberation theologies, that kind of thing. Um, what they really want to do is to define the conditions under which um, LGBT plus identities and relationships can be understood as morally right, psych psychologically healthy, and socially constructive within Christianity, if we're talking about queer theology. How these things are considered not reprehensible morally, but right morally. That's a big focus for queer theology. Um, for some uh, theologians here, the, the cent uh, a central aim is to destabilize discourses and ethics by introducing queer concepts and methods to interrogate constructs of identity and sexuality. Um, it's kind of a good way to understand what is it they're wanting to do. 
Um, so it's very broad. Um, it's not like a fully cohesive movement. There's a lot going on there. So uh, the original terminology uh, that was proposed in the 1990s was pro-feminist gay theology, um, but that term was rejected uh, because they want a much broader term uh, than that. So queer theology became the term. Uh, there are three strands within queer theology. Uh, theology done by and for LGBTQ plus individuals and focused on their situation. Theology that is purposefully opposed to uh, cisgendered heteronormativity, um, which is the social and cultural norms that regard that. Um, or theology that deconstructs these societal categories of sex and gender. So those are the three strands that go on. When we talk about ethics specifically, um, you can talk about queer virtue. Um, so who is my neighbor in that context? So in order to answer that question of who is my neighbor, you have to be able to discern an identity, who you are, be able to tell the truth, even in the face of material risks, that's what it is to love your neighbor, to find others who share this identity, to find who your neighbor is, and then to build community. Um, so those are kind of four key issues within that. Okay, and then um, lastly, uh, we're going to talk about, and, and before we finish this up, um, we do have, uh, there are the readings about disabilities and the place of older persons, as we're also going to be on the discussion page. So um, we're talking about transgender and intersex. Uh, intersex refers to individuals whose physical sex is outside the binary, binary of male and female. Um, so that's the kind of correct term. And then transgender refers to individuals who have, or at one time had, a gender identity that is not in line with the um, dominant paradigm that's connected to their sex. Uh, so there's a distinction between gender and sex that's kind of sitting there. So transgender ethics focuses on ways to psychologically enable and empower those who are transgender. Um, and transgender individuals often, often find themselves on the margins of groups, even on the margins of already marginalized people groups. A lot of times transgender populations, even in the queer community, are viewed as outsiders. Um, so a big focus for transgender ethics is to provide uh, that psychological empowerment um, that they believe that's part of the ethical duty for what it is that they're doing. Um, it tends to be uh, narratival in structure uh, and very socially active in what it is that they are wanting to do. Um, okay, so that's where we're going to end. Uh, that was a rapid fire, but I was able to get it in in under an hour at least. Um, so uh, if you would... Uh, if you're taking the class, please go to the discussion page. I'll send out a link to where that's at and uh, respond to those questions. Uh, I also have some more updates I'll be sending out. All right, thank you, and that's it.